There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking. Just rocking. In a way that's true, if you know what I mean. Just take a look at the senior scene. Well, it's rocking. Yeah, it's rocking. We're pulling our weight, learning the code, clicking our heels. Greetings and welcome to In Praise of Age. Today we have with us Valerie Rob Robler. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Almost. Almost correctly. Uh, and Val is someone that I met because she came to one of my classes. And she gave one of the most poignant class sessions that I've ever had in a class. And Val, we so appreciate your coming today. Uh, and I want people to know that we're going to be talking about organ donations. Uh, and you lost a family member because of the lack of an organ being available for her. Yes. But I want people to know that nationally, 17 people die every day. Every probably more. Day. Every day, because there are not enough organs available. And, and looking at it that way, um, I think makes it personal for everybody. 17 people every single day. Right now, there are about 87,000 people nationwide waiting for an organ. And that number here in North Carolina right now is, is almost 3,000. That's a lot of people who are waiting for someone to save their lives. And if the numbers work the same they did last year, about 700 of those 3,000 will get an organ donation this year. And about 250 of them will die waiting without ever having had the chance. Now this program relates to elders, Val. Uh, but I want people to know that even as an older person, you can still donate. Talk to us about what you can do. Yes, yes, you can at any age. Um, you may not be able to be an organ donor. You can probably at least still be a tissue donor. And when there is a death in the hospital, regardless of the age of the person, um, Carolina Donor Services should be contacted so that they can find out if there's anything that can be salvaged from this person who wanted to give. And even if it can't be organs, it might be skin, it might be their heart valves, it might be their corneas or bone or tendons or ligaments. And all of these seemingly minor things, these tissue donations, can make a huge person make a huge difference, excuse me, to the person receiving them, a burn victim in the hospital who can get a skin donation as a graft till they can grow their own skin and that can make a huge difference to them in terms of their comfort level. Um, someone with glaucoma, blinded blocked by glaucoma, who gets a cornea can see again. And, and these are things that can be unaffected by the age of the donor. And, then make, and make a big difference to the person on the receiving end. Um, we can all give, no matter what our age or condition. And you continue to give through that person. Yes. Now, if someone's listening and they think, well, this is something I would like to do, mm -hmm. how would they go about making arrangements for that? Well, in, in, in order of ascending importance, the first thing is when you renew your driver's license, have them put the little red heart on it, check it, yes, for organ donation. Um, that, that's an easy reminder to you, to everyone who sees that driver's license. The next step is to get a organ donor card, sign it, have your family members witness it, and then carry it in your wallet with your driver's license. And that card, signed and witnessed, is a legally binding document that will allow you to be an organ and or tissue donor, even if your family members cannot be found in time if something were to happen to you. And third, the most important thing is tell your family. Tell the people who will be put in the position of having to make this decision for you after you have died and make sure they all know that this is what you want and how important you think it is to try to help other people. And by doing so, by talking to your family, talk to everybody, your coworkers, your neighbors, let them all know because it gets the word out. It lets people know this is an easy way that I can help people. 
And I want to go back about the driver's license. Yes. This is not legally binding. The no, it is license. not. Talk a bit about that. Um, that is not a legally binding document. It's something that the hospital can use to show a family member who may not be sure of how their loved one felt on the issue to say, well, they did check it on the driver's license, so we would think this is what they would want, and that can help them make the decision because not everyone does talk to their family about it. It's really the donor card being signed and witnessed that is the legally binding document. And I would think it would be important not only for your family to know, but also your attorney and your physician. Unfortunately, with managed care, we don't always have the same physicians anymore. But that's true. That's doctor. true. And since, um, since, in, in it, you may be more likely to be an accident victim or right. something to be in a position to be a donor, and you may not be where your doctors are. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, it never hurts to tell everybody. Tell your lawyer, mm -hmm. tell your doctors, but most especially tell your family, your legal next of kin. And I want to give you plenty of time to tell your story of what happened with your daughter because I think it will give us a lesson in thinking about these things and how important it is to a family. So would you begin the story of what your daughter and what happened? The reason that I talk to people about being an organ and tissue donor and how important it is is because it became very important to our family. Um, my youngest daughter, when she was two years old, contracted a virus. And this is one of those 24-hour bugs, little intestinal bugs, that every child gets at least once a year, especially once they hit school age. It's very common. It's usually no big deal. Um, one in a million, it causes more problems. And she was the one in a million. This virus went to her heart, and it attacked it and weakened it and left her with um, ventricular failure, congestive heart failure, viral myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, all sorts of medical terms to describe the fact that her heart muscle was weakened and could no longer pump effectively. And the months of drug therapy and such that should have worked to heal her heart did not work. And we were faced in the end with um, being told that a heart transplant would be the only thing that could help her. Um, we were terrified. Um, we really didn't think that it could be serious enough to warrant something like a transplant. That is a life-changing event in the person who receives it. Um, you are compromised in some ways for the rest of your life. You, you, you live and, and you can have an amazing quality of life, but the, the thought of putting this now three-year-old onto a regimen where she'd be on um, drugs to control rejection and things like that for the rest of her life was very scary. Um, not having an option, however, we said yes, of course, immediately go for this. This is what we want. And um, having said that, we assumed that it would happen and everything would be great. Doctors are, are miracle workers, and medicine can do everything nowadays, it seems. Um, they told us that without a heart transplant, she had maybe six months to live. They told us that we could expect the wait for a heart to be probably eight or nine weeks. And that those odds sounded pretty good to us. Um, we thought there'd be no problem. But she went into further failure. The, the problems in her heart spread from the left ventricle to the right ventricle shortly after her last hospitalization. And she died two weeks after going on the national list for a heart. Um, and my husband still says if she'd only had the chance, if she'd only had the opportunity, um, he feels that even if she had gotten a heart transplant and then died from complications or something, at least we would know better that everything that could possibly be done had been done. 
um, it didn't occur to us that she would die waiting, that there just aren't enough donors. And, um, and we said, we need to get the word out on this. For hearts especially, half of the people waiting for a heart transplant will die before they get the transplant. Um, heart disease is that serious and there are that few donors. It's a tragedy and we don't want anyone else to go through it. Um, losing our daughter has been the most devastating thing. No parent wants to lose their child. You're not supposed to outlive your children. Um, it just doesn't seem natural. And here we are left to go on without her. And all we can do for her now is make sure that people remember that she was here and that her having been here makes a difference. And if there are, are people who can decide that, well, maybe I can go ahead and be an organ donor, that it won't take anything away from me, it won't cost my family anything, they won't let me die in the hospital sooner because they want my organs. Things like that don't happen. But if I'm dying anyway and I can save someone else, I should do that. And if people can make that decision because of hearing about my daughter, then that it helps give purpose to Good her life. short life. Tell us what the experience was like for you while you waited, because I know this must have been a devastating time. Well, it was, it was all surreal mm -hmm. in a way. Um, Dana is our youngest child. We have two older children. And when she got sick and went on drug therapy and we started having to call, cart her back to the doctors every couple of weeks for another echocardiogram and things so they could monitor her. And every, every time she got a cold, she had to go into the hospital. She was much more susceptible to everything that came along. And we're trying to cope with the reality of a chronically ill child at the same time as we're coping with trying to hold down our jobs and deal with the other two children who were elementary school age at this time. And you know, life is just going on. You have this huge life-changing event. Your child is sick and needs all this care all the time. Yet the mortgage needs to be paid. The bills need to be paid. Um, the six-year-old and the eight-year-old need to be carted back and forth to and from school and scouts and you know, everything's still going on and, and we just adjusted to it in a very unspoken, just do it kind of way. And our lives just took this shift where dealing with everything on a day-to-day -day basis just became the new normal for us all the medicines and everything that Dana had to take. Um, we dealt, she dealt, my other two children, Chris and Kat, they dealt, everyone just took it. This is the new normal. And, and I'd look back on it sometimes, or I'd look, try to step outside of it at times while it's going on and think, and this is just so odd. It's so wrong, but at the same time, we can deal with this because it's not the worst thing. It's not the worst thing because we're holding on to the hope that everything's going to work and Dana will get better. Her heart will heal and she'll grow up and everything will be great. So we dealt with, she dealt with, poor thing. She had more pills and more drops and everything, all these medicines she had to take two and three times a day. And these were not pediatric dosages of things. These were, you know, Lenoxin and, and, and Lasix. <laughs> and, and she's this tiny, tiny, petite little girl. And she'd sit there and she would take those pills and swallow them down when the older two were still using chewable Tylenol. But she knew she had to do it. It didn't occur to her that she had a choice 
about going along with treatment on anything. She was the most stoic, amazing, determined child ever. She, she, she would just take the pills, she'd take the liquid, she took it all, she'd go in, they'd do the echoes. Every time she had to go into the hospital and they had to pull more blood and run IVs and she would just sit there and she would take it all like what other way is there to be? This is my life. This is what I have to do. And as her mother being with her, as she would have to endure some of these things, um, it was really hard. It really was. You must have torn your heart. I, I hate needles myself. I get lightheaded whenever I have to have blood drawn. <laughs> And yet I'd sit there holding her on my lap while they're sticking needles into her, and she never said a peep, never. She was so strong, and that's, and that's part of why it's so heartbreaking that she's gone. This was an amazing little girl, and who knows what she might have accomplished. She'd be 17 years old now if she'd lived and getting ready to get out of school and set off into the world and go on her way. And she could have changed the world. She was that bright and that strong. And now we'll just never know. We'll never know. But in the two and a half years that she lived, she dramatically changed you and your family, didn't she? Oh, she did. She did. Um, she. She was an example. Mm -hmm. and I look back now and say that's how you live. You don't turn your back on the hard things in life. You face them and you deal with them because that's what life is. And you, you get strength from what you have to go through. Um, her brother and sister miss her still even though at this point they can hardly remember her. They were, they, they were so young when she died and her illness was so much a part of their everyday lives that it just became so routine that they didn't even think about it. So it was shocking to them when she died. And it was, it was more sudden for them than it was for us. So her death was not anticipated as such? No, no, It was no. a sudden failure of her heart? She, um, when she was in the hospital the last time and waiting for a heart, and a lot of people who are waiting for heart transplants are home, you know, adults, they're still right. going around living their lives, they got the pager with them all the time for when they get the call from the hospital, but Dana was very ill at mm -hmm. this point and she had to be in the hospital. To, to wait, and somehow... Um, Was she bed fast? Not until the last three days. Um, in the last three days is when her heart started stopping. And um, once, once she had arrested the first time, they had to put her on new drugs. They put her on paralytics that had her bed bound, par paralyzed, essentially. Mm -hmm. She could not move anymore. Was she on a ventilator? She was for the last two days. They said it's not because she has to have one to breathe. It's because we want her to conserve all of her energy, mm -hmm. focus all of her energy on keeping her heart beating. So we're doing the breathing for her. And, and it was such a change because up until up until the first cardiac arrest, she seemed like just a child who was having a down day. She was, she was alert up until that point. Mm -hmm. Sitting up in the hospital bed, she would, um, she'd climb out of the bed. She was still using the potty, you know, mm -hmm. trailing all these wires right. and, and, and IVs coming out of her. Yet, and she, she, she would still sit there and feed herself. Um, so it, she didn't seem so seriously ill. We knew she was seriously ill, but when she's sitting in front of you eating and smiling, you think, well, how bad can it be? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a huge shock at the end, and it, and it did seem very, very sudden. Which even though you knew 
well, you kept hoping for the organ, but you also knew the possibility was there. When it happens, it's overwhelming, isn't it? We were deeply in denial about the possibility that, in, that, that a heart would not come in time. We had that totally blocked out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think it's natural sure. enough for a parent. You want, you want to focus on the good possibilities. Um, why deal with the bad if you don't have to? So we were, we were not prepared for it. And at one point, two days before she died, when we were on the verge of doing that because her kidneys had started to fail, and they're like, well, that's usually the beginning of the end when mm -hmm. the kidneys fail. And we said, well, if it's the end, then it'll be the end. And maybe we should think about taking her off. Within a few hours, her own willpower, her own determination, she started working her kidneys again and started producing urine in the little bag. And we went, oh my God. Oh my God, look at her. She is not ready to give up the fight yet. Mm -hmm. And if she's willing to keep fighting, we're keeping fighting. We will not give up on her. And do you think that finally her body, she couldn't bring the willpower to keep it going? I think it just wore her out. Yeah, she didn't have the energy she anymore. Was, she was too tired. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She was too tired. And even though she was on paralytics, they told us that, um, that mentally that she should still be alert. So we were talking to her the whole time at the mm -hmm, end there. Mm -hmm. And we told her that she didn't have to keep fighting Good. if it was too hard. Mm -hmm. So you gave her permission to die? We, ga we gave her permission. Which is a very difficult thing, but a very positive thing to do, I think, with people when they're dying. I think so. Permission. I think so. I don't. I don't regret telling her that. No, it was so mm -hmm. hard on her. She went through so much. She fought so hard that if it just became too much for her, how could we not let her do what she needed mm -hmm. to? Well, I think there. Val, I think there are times when death becomes a friend, irrespective of age. Mm -hmm. It's far more difficult, of course, when it's a young person, as you said earlier, because when you're older, you feel you've had a fair time with your life to live it. But when a person is very young, and I cannot imagine how difficult it is to lose a child. It's beyond my imagination. It's one of those things that you just don't know unless you've been there. I'm sure. And I've had people, very well-meaning people, try to tell me, I know how you feel because my father died. And even mm -hmm. I know how you feel because my dog died. But trust me, if you haven't had a child die, you don't know. I think that it's, it's a completely unique type of bereavement mm -hmm. um, just because it's, it, it seems so wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how was it like after her death for you and, and your husband and the children? Well, I think... I think we were in shock for a while afterwards, and I mean weeks afterwards. Sure. Um, we had this we had this very calm attitude towards things, and um, stayed out of work for a while. When I when I when I found myself sitting there playing Tetras for six hours nonstop just to keep from having to think about anything, I realized it was time to get back to work just because I needed to engage my brain. I needed to force some structure back into my life. Um, but we just seemed to float through our lives for a while afterwards. Um, and then, and then the, the roller coaster of grief that you go through is, is so unpredictable and so unique to each person. Um, that you can be calm, you can be fine with it, then you can be totally overwhelmed by it, sad, angry, guilty, every emotion under the sun is going to hit you at some point, usually at a very inconvenient moment when you least expect it and are least prepared to deal with it. But you, you stick with it, you count on your friends and your family, you find support and hopefully other people who do know how you feel, which for us was a group called the Compassionate Friends. 
which is a support group specifically for bereaved parents where you could go and no matter what you say to that group they will understand that you know, logic and sensibility have nothing to do with your grief. Your grief is all about emotions and your own feelings and you can go to this group and express them and have it be okay. They won't look at you like you're crazy because even your best friends and, and, and your family, they get tired of hearing about it eventually. And it becomes hard, I think, for your family especially to hear about it. My parents have a hard time hearing about it and talking about it. My mother explained it to me that, um, that she loved Dana and misses Dana, and, but that she knows that her grief as a grandparent is not the same as my grief as a parent. And if I unburden myself to her, it causes her such pain to see her daughter okay. in so much pain. So, um, so I try to spare them a little bit. But it's been, it's been 14 years since Dana died. And while we're okay, our marriage is okay, which is a statistical anomaly. Right. A lot of marriages break up after the right. death of a child. And our surviving children who are now grown are okay. We are a different group of people than we were before all this happened to us. I expect you're a stronger family unit than you were. Because I think one grows with adversity. I, th I, think, I think you're right, but I think it's really hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a fundamental change right. that it changes you without even you even be, being consciously aware of how it's changed you. I think I, I try to keep better perspective on everything in life and what's important and try to make sure that I maintain things with my son and daughter um, because I know that you, you, you don't know how much time you have. You never know when something's going to happen, and bad things, terrible things, accidental things, they can happen in a heartbeat to anyone. Val, thank you so much. I hope we've learned from this the value of looking at our families and ourselves and what we can do to help our fellow citizens through consideration of an organ donation. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you for having me. There's a myth going round town That when you get older you just sit down and start rocking Just rocking In a way that's true if you know what I mean Just take a look at the senior scene Well it's rocking Yeah it's rocking We're pulling our weight Learning the code, clicking our heels, sharing the load, and every so often we're hitting the road. Yeah, we're rocking. Well, I must be going, got a game at three. Then kids to be tutored, they're counting on me. It's a brand new century.